This morning we are going to be looking at a passage in Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. I trust the book of Romans is perhaps one of the most familiar to us. Um, even though it does have some things in it that are difficult to understand, I think above all, Paul explains the gospel so thoroughly in this book. And in this particular section, he is reminding us of the condition in which our Lord found us uh, before He saved us, before He sent His Son into the world, to remind us that He didn't send His Son into the world to save those who were good or righteous or those who were nearly perfect, but rather He sent His Son into the world to save those who were His enemies, who positively hated Him and wanted nothing to do with Him. Uh, this is the mercy of God, that He is willing to so, show such great love and grace to those who hate Him and have sinned against Him. Let's read about that in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. Paul writes this, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance, proven character, and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than now, having been justified by His blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through Him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of His Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. May the Lord uh, bless His Word to our hearing this morning, as again we're reminded of what it is the Lord has done for each one of us who have trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I think it's um, clear by now, as we've been going through this series on having a heart for God, that the Lord had a particular purpose in mind when He saved us, and He didn't save us so that we might uh, remain as we are, but rather that we might be changed, that we might begin to reflect His nature, or which basically is the same thing, that we might become like His Son. Uh, Paul reminds us that we have been redeemed. We have been, uh, actually, before we were redeemed, it was God's plan. It was His plan to predestine us or to, you know, ensure that we would become conformed to the image of His Son. Now, that's not something that God intends to happen uh, simply at the point of death. In other words, you know, we're not going to change at, at all. And then when we die, we suddenly become perfect, although we do thank God that uh, when we do die, that work is instantly perfected and we become like the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's something that He actually intends that would begin in this life before it's completed in the next. He wants it to begin here so that we would be, while we're here, a living testimony of His mercy and grace, a living testimony to the fact that the gospel is true. In other words, the Lord wants us to share the gospel more than just in word. He wants to make us to be living letters read by all men. That's the reason why God gave us His Holy Spirit. That's the reason why He changed our hearts and our lives, why it's more than just, as it were, a matter of profession and an instant of faith, 
but it is a lifetime of repentance and following the Lord Jesus Christ, becoming more like Him. Jesus reminded His own disciples what it is that would be the evidence that, um, that they belong to Him and that His gospel was true. He says, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Now, that's also why it shouldn't be surprising to us that when the Lord looks throughout the earth for someone to use, His eyes are going to light upon those who have actually made progress, <coughs> those who have actually grown into the image of His Son, those who are becoming more like Him. The more you are like Him, the more you're going to stand out, and the more, of course, He's going to use you. And the more He uses you, the more your life is going to be fulfilled. You know, all of us are actually wanting to have a fulfilling life. We want our life to mean something. We want to, you know, do something with it that's, that's going to be significant. But I'm afraid many people in this world seek to do it in ways that are really meaningless. They may actually help some other people along the way, but they're not doing something they're going to be remembered for forever because this world is going to perish and everything in it. The only thing that is going to survive are the things that we do for the Lord. Those are the significant things. Well, the more you're like God, the more He's going to use you, uh, the more your life is going to have purpose and the more you are going to be rewarded and remembered for all eternity. Now, if that's what you want, and if you are a believer here this morning, that is what you actually do want, then you need to pay attention to what it is He says He's looking for in you, what He wants you to be, what it is that catches His eye. Well, what else can we learn about these things? Well, today we're going to consider that the Lord looks for someone who is willing to show mercy. This is simply another way in which you are to reflect His image. Now, this morning, as I've already told you, we're going to look at the mercy that the Lord has shown you because this evening we're going to, to consider that He wants you to show that same mercy to others. So first of all, let's focus on the mercy that He has shown you by looking at two things. First of all, what it is, according to the text, that Paul says you deserved. And then secondly, what it is Paul says that God gave you instead, you know, the mercy that He showed you. So first of all, what does Paul say here about what you deserved? Well, you deserve nothing more or nothing less than what the condition you were in demanded. And what exactly was your condition before the Lord came to you in His mercy? Well, Paul says, first of all, that you were helpless, verse 6. The word literally means weak, it means sick, it means what you would think it would mean. You were absolutely helpless or unable to do anything to help yourself. Now, you know by now that when God says things like this, He's not talking about your physical condition. I mean, there were things we could do for ourselves. There are people in the world who exert a tremendous amount of energy and strength seeking after the things they want. But that's not what he's talking about here. He's not talking about your physical condition, but your spiritual condition. You were in a kind of, well, helpless condition that rendered you completely unable to do anything to help yourself. As a matter of fact, the Bible would say spiritually you were dead, which means that you weren't even able to reach out and take hold of the help that God may have offered to you in the gospel. You were no more able to do that than a dead man would be able to reach out and take hold of any help you might offer to him in a cemetery. You were helpless. There was nothing you could do. Now again, spiritually helpless because, as we're going to see, you were unwilling to do anything or to, to even accept the help that God had for you. Now, why is it that you were helpless? Well, Paul tells us secondly in verse 6, it was because you were ungodly. You were averse to God. Uh, God was the last thing on your list 
of priorities. If you um, were to, let's say, do a poll of unbelievers in our nation and put on there a list of things that they thought were important, you wouldn't find God on that list. At least you wouldn't find the true God because the ungodly aren't concerned about God. They don't want God. And that's what you were like when you were in this helpless state. You didn't want to know God. You didn't want to learn about God. You didn't want to know how you might serve Him or honor Him, even though the Bible says you knew very well that God made you and that God took care of you and gave you every good thing that you have. You know, every atheist in the world is only self-deceived. Even the most prominent ones that use the most uh, elaborate arguments against the existence of God, they actually believe that God exists regardless of what they're saying. They know He exists. And you knew that God exists and you knew that He was responsible for all the good that He had shown you, but you didn't care about that. You didn't care for Him. You had no interest in worshiping Him. You had no interest in living the kind of life that would please Him. This is simply to say that you were rebellious against God. You had no interest in Him, no interest in His plan for you. Now, why is that? Well, it's because Paul says, thirdly, you were a sinner. Verse 8, you had a sinful heart. Now, as we read this, we might be tempted to think that Paul has in mind here the guilt of Adam's sin, which is what made you guilty, the sin that he committed when he stood for you in the garden and failed the test that God gave him in which he represented you by rebelling against that command not to eat of the tree. And perhaps he does because that does make you a sinner. But Paul certainly has in view the results of that sin which is the corruption that is in your heart. You were helpless, you were ungodly, you were a rebel against God because you had a rotten heart, a corrupt heart with nothing good in it at all. And that's why Paul says, fourthly, in verse 10, that you were his enemy. Now, most Christians today really don't believe this. They really don't believe this uh, This caricature, I wouldn't call it a caricature because I believe it's, a, uh, it's actually an accurate representation of what we were like prior to God's mercy. And that's usually because that's not what they're taught. But you do need to understand that you were at war with God because of your sinful and corrupt heart, and God was actually at war with you. See, the battle was not just one-sided. The battle was both on both sides. The usual characterization that we hear, God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life, simply isn't true as we usually understand that, at least at one level. Though it is true that if you are a believer now, He certainly did love you from all eternity and had a plan for you, but that doesn't mean that in your state that you were in then, that you weren't at war with God and God with you. You see, the peace comes once you repent of your sins and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it also wasn't true that you had a desire for God in your heart, some goodness left over from the fall, you know, that gave you the power, that gave you the ability to reach out to God and receive His kind offer of salvation in Jesus Christ. The Bible says that you hated God. You didn't do anything good. You didn't seek after God. You were in the flesh and completely unable to do anything pleasing to Him. Even as Jesus said to the Jews in John chapter 6, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. And one thing I think that is startling to hear, but something which the Bible actually says, even though God even loved those of His own from all eternity who would trust in Him, Yet when you were outside of Christ and you were in this world and you were living according to the prince of the power of the air and you hated God, that God actually hated you too. It's hard to imagine both of those things working together, but that is true. And that's exactly what, uh, well, the psalmist says in Psalm 5, verse 5. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all who do iniquity. Well, who does iniquity? Everyone. And when you hated God, 
And when you hated his ways, you also committed iniquity. That's all that you did. The psalmist says, you hate all who do iniquity. Well, you were ungodly. You were sinful. And so you were God's enemy. And so what does Paul say that you deserved? Well, he says you deserved God's wrath. The Bible says that God is holy, which means that, that He is just and that God cannot ignore sin. God cannot just pretend it doesn't happen. He has to bring everything that everybody does that's wrong to judgment. And what does sin deserve? Well, the wages of sin is death. Uh, that is eternal death. That's not just the death that we will experience at the end of our physical life, although it deserves that as well. Adam's sin brought death into the world, but it also brought about God's judgment. Even the least sin deserves God's judgment. It actually deserves infinite punishment. Again, I would remind you, because the sins we commit are not just against others, but they are against an infinitely holy God who is infinitely offended by the sins we commit. It deserves God's wrath. Now, that's what you deserved because you were guilty of Adam's sin, because you were guilty of all the sins you committed from the time you came into this world to the time when the Lord actually saved you, because you actually had in your heart a hatred against God. You see, that alone would have been reason enough for the Lord to condemn you is that you hated Him. You were His enemy. Now, what this all means is that you deserved hell. That's what I deserved as well. We all deserved it. You deserved to suffer there for an eternity, to be roasted alive in that eternal furnace. Again, we're reminded that because we're limited creatures and we can only suffer so much that we can never fully satisfy God's justice for the sins we have committed against Him. And that's the reason why the suffering has to go on forever because we will never fully satisfy the justice of God through our limited suffering. Now, I realize that all sounds very negative, and it is. This is what you and I were like apart from the grace of God. This is what you and I deserved. We deserve God's wrath. But you see, we're never going to understand God's mercy unless we first understand what it is we actually deserved. I mean, if God just forgave somebody who was a little off perfect, you know, he who is forgiven little is thankful little. But he who is forgiven much is thankful much. And the more you understand how much you were forgiven the more thankful you're going to be. And so the more you're going to worship the Lord and the more you're going to be willing to show mercy. But you see, this is the point that Paul is making. This is what you deserve. But this isn't what God gave you. God showed you mercy. He didn't leave you to die in your sins. He didn't leave you to agonize for all eternity in that furnace of fire, which is a very real place. But He sent his son into the world, the one whom he loves more than any other, to save you. He showed you mercy. And Jesus showed you mercy because he was willing to come. And he was willing to do what was necessary to save you. He was willing to obey his father's commandments, which he delighted in anyway because that was his heart. But he was willing to do that as a man. And he was willing to suffer and die on the cross for you. And remember, that wasn't just the pain of the, of the nails and the, and, and the, the beatings and, uh, you know, hanging on the cross, which would be excruciatingly painful. But it was the pain of your sins being laid upon Him and God's wrath being poured out against Him for the sins that you had committed. Jesus was willing to do this, to show mercy upon you so that you could be just and so that God could be just and bring you to heaven. Jesus did this to make you righteous in God's eyes. Now, again, we've already seen that God is holy. God loves what is right, and God hates sin. 
He hates evil so strongly, he can't let any sinner into heaven. Habakkuk writes regarding God in Habakkuk 1 verse 13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. And for that reason, the only people that God can actually let into heaven are those who are perfect. But who is perfect? Are you perfect? Of course not. The Bible says you're far from perfect. There is only one who is perfect, and that is Jesus Christ. And He is the only one that God could actually let into heaven, that the Father could let into heaven, because He is the only one who has actually loved the Father with a perfect heart and showed that He did by doing only the things that please Him. Jesus never did anything to please Himself. He did everything to please the Father. Everything that is self-serving is basically sin. Now, the Father will let Jesus into heaven. He'll let Him in because He is just. He alone is just. But again, here's where the Father shows you mercy because He says in His Word, He will not only let the Son in, but He will also let those in who are in Jesus Christ. And how do you actually get into Jesus Christ? It's by trusting Him. It's by turning from your sins. It's by relying upon Him to forgive you of your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness, and it's by following Jesus Christ. Now, I should say that that is the fruit of His mercy upon you. You get into heaven by being in Christ, but you get into Christ, as it were, by trusting in Him alone. The fruit of the fact that you are in Him and that you are united with Him is the evidence of those good works, turning away from the wrong things and doing the right things. Now, again, thankfully the Father sent His Son into the world to do this. Jesus did not do what He did for Himself. He did it for you. He did it as your representative. At least He did if you are trusting Him this morning and turning away from your sins. You know, Adam represented you in the garden and Adam condemned you in the garden through his sin. But Jesus also represented you and saved you through His obedience. Uh, not only that, but the Bible says that Jesus continues to keep you safe in heaven through His continuing work of mediation. He continues to pray for you. He continues to give you His Spirit. He continues to watch over you and to guide you and to uh, rule over you and overrule all the things that come into your life for your good to make sure that you are going to get to heaven, to make sure that you will never perish. That is the mercy of God, and that is the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. But again, don't forget your condition. When He set out to save you, what you were like, you were helpless, you were ungodly, you were sinful and you were God's enemy, you were not good. Now, Paul asked the question, how many of you would be willing to lay down your life as Jesus did for someone who is good? I mean, maybe you would, he says. Maybe man would do this. Maybe you would do this for a good man. Maybe you would do it for a righteous man. If you love someone enough, if you see enough value in them, that's something that you will do, right? I mean, you might lay down your life for your children. You might lay down your life for your spouse, maybe for your parents, maybe for a, a dear friend. But how many of you would be willing to lay down your life, to give your life, to save somebody else's life if that person hated you? If that person had done many different things to injure you and to offend you, how many of you would be willing to lay down your life for an enemy now, maybe some of you could say that you would do that now with the grace of God, but none of you would have done that apart from the grace of God. But you see, here's the point that Paul is making. God would do this. God was infinitely offended by your hatred, by your sins against Him, and yet He was willing to give what was most precious to Him, to reconcile you to Himself, to bring you into His family, and to make sure that you would make it safely to heaven. 
and he did not give you the hell that you so richly deserved. That is the mercy of God. And we really can't fully appreciate it as much as we might try. I think the only way that we could feasibly do this would be somehow to imagine uh, what it would be like to be in hell. And that's something we tend to recoil at. It's something that even many churches today just want to put out of their minds. They don't want to think about it. People don't like to hear about it. They certainly don't like to hear that they're on their way there. That's one of the things that Jonathan Edwards was actually criticized probably more than anything else. They, they thought he was exaggerating hell, but as a matter of fact, he wasn't. He was only trying to describe what it must be like. And he thought if he did that, perhaps people would wake up to their need of Jesus Christ, that they might reach out to Him if God is willing to show them mercy and grace. And so he preached a lot about hell. Well, we can't spend a few moments in hell. We can think about it. We can think about what it must be like. And if we imagine what that might be like and imagine that going on forever and ever and realize that's what we deserved, but that's not what God gave us, perhaps we'll begin to understand the mercy of God. He didn't give us the fiery hell. You know how much it hurts when you get spattered with just a droplet of grease that's hot? Or if you've ever burned yourself on something that's hot or in the fire? Imagine your whole body being on fire for all eternity and suffering in this writhing agony that goes on without intermission, without interruption forever and ever. Realize that's what you deserved and God is going to take you and place you in a world that is full of the greatest experience we could ever imagine, where our hearts are just bursting with love and joy and pleasure forever. That is God's mercy. And God wants us to know its mercy. Now, why does He want you to know that? You know, why is it important that we focus on this? Well, for one thing, He does want you to appreciate what it is He's done for you. Again, you weren't just a notch below perfect. God, God didn't just sort of give you a, a little nudge, as it were, to kind of put you over the hump so that you could make it into heaven when you fell short just by just a little bit. Remember that you were helpless, ungodly, sinful, and you would have roasted in hell forever, but God had mercy on you. You need to see this in order to be thankful to thank God in the way that you should. When you come together to worship Him, we think about all the things, well, He's given me this to eat and He's given me these clothes, He's given me this house. All those things we do need to thank God for. He's given all of us those things. But there are greater things that He has given us and we need to thank Him for those things, most of all, that He has given us through Jesus Christ. But secondly, you need to understand it because as we've already seen, God calls you to follow His example. He wants you to be like Him. He wants you to follow the example that His Son gave to you. He wants you to show mercy to others, even as He has shown mercy to you. Be merciful, Jesus says, just as your Father is merciful. The more you understand His mercy the more this should move you to show mercy. And the more you show mercy, the more God is going to see you and use you for His glory. And, of course, the more He's going to reward you in heaven. Now, as I said at the beginning, this is just laying the groundwork for what it is we're going to be looking at this evening, which is going to be primarily applying this, although I hope you've already seen, there's a great deal of application already. We've seen what it is we were. We've seen what it is God has done for us in His infinite mercy. If you are trusting the Lord Jesus Christ, this evening we want to see what it is that this mercy, that this example calls us to do toward others. And we're going to look at that from Matthew chapter 18, the parable of the unforgiving slave who was forgiven this great debt by his Lord, but who refused to show mercy in forgiving even a small debt of a fellow slave. God's mercy calls us to show mercy to others, and that's what we want to see. 
But again, let's not miss the point. This mercy that God has for us is only in Jesus Christ. And it doesn't belong to you until you actually put your trust in Him, until you actually believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and place your whole hope of heaven on Him and turn from your sins and begin to follow Him is the evidence that you truly have trusted in Him. That is how you receive the mercy of God. If you do not receive it, you're going to receive His judgment as the parable uh, this, that we're going to look at this evening also reminds us. So let's bow in a few moments of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us search our hearts to see whether or not we have received this mercy. And if we have, then let's focus on it. Let's let it stir us up to thankfulness and also stir us up to show or be willing to show mercy to others. Let's let the table remind us again of what the mercy that Jesus was willing to show us in order that we might be reconciled to God and let that stir us up again to do the same thing. And if we haven't received the mercy of God, well then, as you pray, pray that God would give you the grace to receive Him. Let's, uh, let's spend a few moments now in prayer.